Building a cult brand, the lane startup, the world's most interesting man, and Juliet's world famous chocolate chip cookies. Stick around! Welcome to Business Edge Radio, the show that gives you tips, tricks, tools, and techniques about how to build a more profitable business while at the same time creating your perfect lifestyle. It's a show about working less and living more. A few golden nuggets, a little bit of wisdom, and over 35 years of business experience to help you keep your edge. Lifestyle entrepreneur, best-selling author, internationally renowned business speaker, and daddy of three, Mitch Graff brings the heat with actionable techniques for building the business and lifestyle of your dreams. Now your host, Mitch Graff. Well, hello there, Unleashed Tribe. And welcome to another edition of Business Edge Radio, the ultimate brainstorming session for your business and your life. I'm your host, Mitch Graff, and I want to start today's show with a simple question for you and an exercise for your back deck this weekend. And here's the question. If you could start a brand new business today, no rules, no boundaries, anything you wanted, what would it be? And I want you to let your mind wander a little bit and see where it takes you. And remember that imagination and daydreaming is where innovation and new ideas come from. So it's completely okay to spend a little bit of time in the creation playground. On today's show, we're going to be talking about how you can build a cult brand around your products and services. I also have a review of a fantastic book called The Lean Startup. We spend some time digging in my mailbag, which seems to get bigger by the day. And I interview a man that I consider to be the world's most interesting man, Michael Warshaw, who makes his living as one of the most well-known and well-respected professional photographers in the world. But he's got some golden nuggets that he wants to share with us today. Remember those commercials? I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer Dos Equis. <laughs> And we're going to make the perfect batch of chocolate chip cookies in today's episode of Cooking Corner with Mitch. So hang on to the end of the show for that. Water. It's everywhere. It's free. This is a product that has always amazed me, something that we have access to for free, yet we gladly will pay good money for the convenience of not having to get it from our tap at home or because we simply want to belong to the brand. It's in our lakes, in our mountains, in our schools, in the showers, in our sinks. Remind me again of why there's so many water brands on the shelves today when it's something that we can get for free in most places. We will spend anywhere between $1 and $10 on a single bottle of water, not just to get hydrated, but to belong to a brand or a cult, if you will. People that walk around with a bottle of Perrier don't do so because they're necessarily thirsty. They do because they belong to a tribe, a group of like-minded people from all over the world that have bought into the Perrier brand. Dasani, Aquafina, Evian all have created cult-like followings for their brands. We purchase over 50 billion bottles a year in the U.S. alone. Worldwide, that number is more than 200 billion bottles a year. And I have a secret to tell you that I'm sure most people already know, but we don't like to admit it to ourselves. In the purest form, water is water. (laughs) There's no such thing as a better quality of water. Now, assuming that it's void of minerals and any impurities, water is water. And now that we have that figured out, we can now move on. (laughs) Two bottles. The same H2O inside. Two diametrical opposite markets. One is the low end, where a small bottle of water goes for pennies. The other is the high end landscape, where it goes for as much as 10 bucks. And remember that water very similar to this is available from your sink or a garden hose in your backyard. One is a buck, one is 10 bucks. And how do you pull something like this off? Both have bottles, both have lids, both have labels, both have, wait for it, water inside those bottles and in most cases the cost of producing those two bottles is relatively the same believe it or not now let's take the conversation a step further two watches sitting side by side on one side you have a timex great watch keeps time (laughs) and the other one you have a rolex both fit nicely on your wrist both look very nice 
and both tell time. So why do people pay north of 10 grand for Rolex when they can get a Timex for 50 bucks or less and it tells time just as well? Or take motel change. You got Motel 6 on one side, Marriott on the other. Why do we pay $200 for a room at a Marriott and you can find a room in a Motel 6 for $49.99 and they'll leave the light on for you? <laughs> they both have beds, they both have sinks and showers and windows, and at the end of the night, both will give you a good night's sleep. Of course, with Marriott, you get the fancy mint on the pillow and your toilet paper is in the shape of a trout or a swan or something like that. But both deliver to you a good night's rest. Hershey's chocolate versus Godiva chocolate. Both are very good chocolate. One's a dollar, one's about 10 bucks. Most people couldn't tell you the difference between them. And I am probably one of those people. Uh, BMW and Ford Escort both have steering wheels, both have seats, they have radios, they have windows, they get you to and from where you're going. So why do we pay so much more for a BMW? The answer is very simple. It's in the brand that these companies have crafted around their product and in our minds, and it's in the story behind their brands. How about if you and I go into business together, and let's say we decide to start a bottled water company. And let's say we wanted to go after the, the higher end market. First, obviously, we have to have a incredible looking bottle with a logo and graphics that will really draw people into the bottle. You've heard me say before to look at what everyone else is doing and to don't do that and come up with something different. So we want to make sure that our bottle was perhaps a little different shape, had a very attractive logo and a name that stood out. Maybe something like Mountain Creek Water Company. And the logo can be a graphic of a fresh, clear mountain stream that shows majestic peaks in the background and a deep blue skyline. Now, in your mind's eye, you probably are seeing this bottle right now, aren't you? And since most other bottled water companies use heavy blue on their bottle, and if you think about it, you see blue just about on every single label, which signifies water, and I understand that. But let's not make our primary color blue. Maybe we go with a green that signifies nature and trees and also subconsciously gives us the association for health and eco-friendly and organic. Well, as I mentioned before, water is water. But it is important to understand how colors play an important role in the way that consumers react to a product or service, as well as the packaging or the branding that surrounds it. And maybe for our label, we use a dramatic combination of both blue and green to create a bottle that is head and shoulders above anything else on the market. And on the back of the label, we can tell the story about how our water comes from the highest, cleanest, purest location in the mountains and how we take the utmost care in making sure that their bottle of water is as fresh and great tasting as any water they will ever have. When we think of mountains, we think of a place where there's less people and less pollution and a better quality of life, right? So what kind of customer would we be targeting? Well, someone who likes the great outdoors, for sure. Our bottle and graphics will definitely take care of that. Or perhaps it's the source of the water that will trigger the right emotion. Using words like mountain or crystal clear or glacier are far more marketable than just another ground level spring or a river, regardless of how pure, pristine, and intact it might be in reality. So now we have a gorgeous bottle that outshines all the others on the shelf. We have a story that makes an emotional connection with our consumers and a price point that justifies those elements. And let me ask you, as a consumer, if you saw this beautiful bottle of cold, refreshing water in your local store right next to all the other bottled waters, would you be inclined to purchase it more than the others? Well, my bet is that you probably would say yes. Would you feel like it was a better quality water? Probably. Would you say that this bottle of water was worth more than the others on the shelf? More than likely. Would it make you feel more like you were part of a group of other people who like clear, refreshing mountain water? <laughs> Absolutely. And that's how you create a cult-like following for your products and services. Now, what's that easy? If we craft a compelling story and message, people will have an emotional reaction to it. It's a basic human behavior. We want to believe. And once people are indoctrinated into our story, they will ruthlessly defend your brand at all costs. It's not just a bottle of water, it's a statement. It's an ID card that our friends immediately recognize. A single 
swift look and people know that we belong, right? It doesn't matter that we paid a thousand percent over the real market value. We bought access. We bought a privilege. And need I remind you that this is something that most people in the world can get for free with a little bit of effort. These brands have created a sense of tribalism for their products. And with it has come tremendous amounts of profits. Your goal should be to create the same type of zest and zeal for your brand so that people will proclaim your name from the highest mountaintop and you will have a cultic-like following for your products and services. You do this and the rest is a piece of cake, I promise. Nike, Apple, Harley Davidson, Gucci, <laughs> need I see more? Here's my email address. Use the email. Email. We get your mail. We get your mail. Let's dive in to Mitch's mailbag and answer some of your burning questions. I am very excited to dive into my mailbag this week. We've been getting a tremendous amount of mail from y'all, and I really, really appreciate all the love you've been sending. Our first question comes from Peter in Cleveland, Ohio. He writes, hey, Mitch, I've been a big fan since I bought your book, The Passionate Life. Well, that was a couple days ago and have tried to keep up on your books as they come out. I opened an online auction company about two years ago and have not been able to crack the code of becoming profitable. I'm the only employee and work about 12 hours a day, six days a week, but I do take a half a day off on Sundays. Well, good for you, Pete. <laughs> my family never sees me and I forgot what it was like to have a hobby. What do you recommend I do short of shutting down, which I am not willing to do at this point since I have most of my savings invested into the business? Well, Pete, it sounds like you have fallen into the old entrepreneur trap of letting the business kind of overtake your life. And I could probably spend a whole day with you talking about this, but let me see if I can boil it down to about three of the most important things that you can do. Number one, you need to sit down and write out a list of all the activities that you do in and for your business. And I do mean everything. Write it down. Then I want you to break those activities up into the following three categories. The first one is what I call your foundational $15 to $20 an hour activities. Now, this is things that keep your business moving down the road. Things like answering the phone, working on your website, filling customer orders, and things like that. The second category are your 50, 50, $50 an hour activities. And this is the day-to-day -day management of your business. Sales goals and objectives, designing marketing collateral, networking, customer service, etc. Then there's the $500 an hour activities, which Pete, this is where you should be spending a majority of your time. These are things that actually grow your revenues and build your business. You've heard the old saying about working on the business instead of working in the business. Well, you've been sucked into the working in your business and it's preventing you from spending your valuable time on the tasks that can actually grow your business. So that's number one. Number two, you need to come up with a game plan on hiring an employee. And I know this might be hard to hear, but you need to hire somebody to take care of your, if nothing else, the 15 to $20 an hour tasks. And in your mind right now, you are yelling at me. I can hear you. I hear you. <laughs> uh, you can't afford to hire somebody. Well, Pete, it will actually save you money by bringing in a part-time employee. It's actually going to be less expensive for you. Right now, you are not putting any real value on your time. And we need to change that mindset to one that says that your time does have a value, a tremendous value. Not only will you get a majority of your time back to reinvest into the management and the building of your company, but you're going to have some time that you can spend with that family of yours. And in your email, you said that you don't have time to spend with your family, which I assume that means you have kids. Well, Pete, before you know it, your kids are all grown up with families of their own, and you will wonder where all that time went. And I don't want you to be one of those guys. If I were to guess, I would say that one of the main reasons that you started a business in the first place is so that you could have the financial freedom and the time freedom to be able to enjoy a life a little bit, right? You wanted to be able to spend more time with the people in your life that meant the most. Well, here you are, 100 hours a week later. Now, being an online business, you may be able to hire a virtual assistant 
that is not necessarily headquartered in the U.S., you may be able to hire an extremely proficient and professional worker for 5 to 10 bucks an hour. Or if you need someone here in the States, 15 to $20 an hour will get you a wonderful person that can take care of some of that pressure that has been on your shoulders that I know you're feeling, my man. And don't feel bad. It's a common trap that most entrepreneurs fall into. And one of the goals of this show is to help people to work less and live more. And we're always looking for ways to work smarter and more efficiently so that we can build the lifestyle of our dreams and then reverse engineer to figure out what our business blueprint needs to look like from there. The problem is that a majority of entrepreneurs and forward thinkers like you, Pete, have fallen prey to the working for yourself siren and have forsaken the things in life that have the most meaning. Our families have taken the biggest hit in the last 20 to 30 years, I would say. If you spend an extra two hours at the office on a Saturday morning, that's two hours that has had to come from some other activity like playing with your kids or spending time with your spouse or something as simple as just going to the driving range and hitting a bucket of balls. Something had to be sacrificed in order for you to be able to spend that little bit of extra time at the office. You can't magically invent a 25th hour. It doesn't happen unless you have a special power that can make it so, and I don't think you do. <laughs> when starting out, the temptation to want to do everything is extremely overwhelming. And the main reason is because we know how to do it. And we mistakenly think that we will save money by doing everything ourselves. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. And if you start out that way, guess what? Those habits and those routines become embedded into our brain so deep that it becomes very difficult to break free from them. And number three, I want you to create a new and improved schedule for yourself that includes time for working, of course, time dedicated for just your family, and time dedicated for just you, okay? And then I want you to make sure that you do everything in your power to make sure that you stick to this schedule. It may take a little time to get used to, but it will be well worth it. And just remember why it was that you got into this game in the first place. Thanks for the email, Pete. All right, next question comes from Juliet in Susanville, California. Side note from mom. <laughs> My 12-year-old listens to your show with me every week and wants me to pass on her question to you. She wants to own her own business one day, and we find that your show is giving her some good advice on what she needs to think about. Well, Mom, thank you for listening in, and thank you even more for bringing your daughter along for the ride. So here's her note to me. Mr. Mitch, how cute is that? My brother has a job delivering papers on Sunday mornings, but I'm not old enough to do that job. What job do you think I should do to make money for the summer? XOXO Juliet. Hugs and kisses. That's nice. <laughs> First of all, Juliet, it's awesome that you enjoy listening to the show with your mom. And I'm so happy to hear that you want to be your own boss one day. And that your mom is exposing you to this type of information so early in your life. That is incredible. I have a funny feeling that there is something extra special in store for you when you grow up, Juliet. And as far as what you can do to make money, or shall we say, what kind of business can you start at the ripe old age of 12? Let me count the ways. Well, first of all, is there anything that you enjoy doing already, like cooking or baking or sewing or yard work? If so, you may already have the answer right there. Since I'm a big believer in kids and parents doing things together, how about if we talk your mom into being a partner in Juliet's Gourmet Baking Company? How does that sound? And your first product is going to be your secret recipe gourmet chocolate chip cookies. I think that every mom in the world has a recipe for really good chocolate chip cookies. So your mom can help you with that. The first thing I want you to do is go to the store and look at the packaging for other cookies that are on the market already. Take a notepad, okay, because you, you want to take some notes. And if you have a camera, take some of those as well so you guys can talk about it later on. Very important. Notice the colors. Uh, the graphics, the photos that are on the labels, the fonts, meaning the style of the lettering in the logo and on the packaging. Then go home and start scribbling ideas down on what you want your logo and packaging to look like. I would recommend you start by selling them in either a two-pack or a three-pack 
to make it easier for people to say yes. If you only have them by the dozen, you may have a lot of people that say no just because, number one, it's more expensive, but number two, it's a lot of cookies to eat. For my house, not at all, but... <laughs> so offer them in a two-pack or a three-pack, more likely to say yes. This way, you can also charge more for each cookie than as opposed to selling them by the dozen like most places. You can use things like Ziploc bags for your packaging. You can go to your local office supply store and get some peel and stick labels for your label. Perhaps a shipping label size will work well for the front of your bag. Then head to the kitchen to perfect your recipe and figure out what size you want each cookie to be. Uh, you can sit down with mom or dad, have them help you with designing a simple little flyer that has your photo, uh, maybe a picture of the cookie, and a little bit of information about who you are. Because remember, people love buying from kids. <laughs> and of course, the prices. Then make a list of all your friends and families who you can call. If you live in a neighborhood, I want you to go door to door and knock on every single door asking people if they would like to buy your fresh baked gourmet world famous chocolate chip cookies and doing something like this will expose you to several Im important skill sets that you will need Juliet like sales marketing cost of goods uh, production cost controls money management how to work with others which is an important thing actually a very very vital thing when it comes to being an entrepreneur thank you so much for that question Juliet and let me know how things go Today, I want to take a look at a book that should be on the bookshelf of every entrepreneur in the world as it resets the way that you look at not just starting the business, but running a business as well. The book is called The Lean Startup, how today's entrepreneurs use continuous innovation to create radically successful businesses by Eric Ries. And we are truly living in a world of the startup these days. Almost everyone has the means and technology to start a business. However, just because it is more accessible doesn't mean it's any easier. In fact, for every successful startup, there are literally hundreds of duds that fall short. In the Lean Startup, Eric Reese goes through the process that you need to take to create a startup that is not only sustainable, but also successful. He mentions in the book that you have to look at a startup differently than an established business, as you have no history to help predict your future. Here's the three main lessons from the book. Number one, make sure you manage your startup like a startup. Build, measure, learn, repeat. Initially, you need to focus on one growth engine and build from there. And too often, new businesses try to be all things to all people. And this book gives a detailed path on how to truly focus on one product or one service at the beginning. It's more of a mindset shift. For a long-standing corporation, the process for future growth is simple. Create an overarching plan and hire the right people to help see it through. Seems simple. However, a startup is a completely different animal than an established business. A startup has no history to base decisions from, so planning a future is near impossible. Yet a lot of startups use corporate management tools like milestone plans and long-term marketing projections. Many of these startups plan every little detail and make sure that their product is perfect before going to market. This logic is flawed at best for a startup. How can you create the perfect product or service when you don't have a customer? <laughs> well, there's a saying that goes, done is better than perfect. It's called MVP, Minimal Viable Product. It's almost like you are creating a key and looking for a lock that it fits in when you can find an unopened lock and then create a key to open it. Focusing too much on your product and not on the customers will also kill your startup. If you're starting a business, there's only one initial goal that you should be focusing on, creating a sustainable business model. That's it. That means that you have to be always experimenting and trying to find a group of customers with the same problem and then you give them a way to solve that problem. And like any experiment, you'll start with the hypotheses. Customer X struggles with Y and would purchase Z to solve it. And then you test accordingly. Experiment until you find a hypothesis that you prove and away you go. All right, lesson number two. Having a successful startup 
is basically a continuous failure until you finally succeed. Don't worry though, that failure is what you want. That failure is learning. And to have a business that is ready for the long term, you have to learn which product to build, whom to build it for, and how to promote it, how to advertise it. For example, Zappos had the hypothesis that people would buy shoes online. Pretty simple hypothesis. For their minimal viable product, for their MVP, they created a fake store with photos of shoes from other shoe stores. And then when enough people tried to buy the shoes from their website, they then created an actual store and started selling shoes. <laughs> with your MVP, minimally viable product, your goal is to test and see what works and adapt until you find something that sticks. This requires you to collect the right data, talk to the prospective clients to get the honest feedback that you need. You may find that you need to make small tweaks or you might even have to do a, a larger pivot. A pivot is a more substantial fundamental change. Maybe the core value of your product is off or perhaps you need to change the target market slightly. A pivot usually comes from a change in your hypothesis. Regardless, don't consider a pivot as a failure. You are learning and a step closer to creating a sustainable business model. Every business will have to make pivots in the startup phase. Groupon, for example, originally started as a fundraising platform before pivoting to the daily deals platform that we all know and love today. In lesson three, initially focus on one growth engine and build from there. And to me, that means you focus on a single product or service, build it out, and then you can do line extension. You can add things after that. I've used many aspects of this book when I ventured into the new startup world and can highly recommend you add it to your list of must-haves. You can find this book as well as many other great reads at powermarketing101.com forward slash hotlist. That's powermarketing101.com forward slash hotlist. Hi there, this is Mitch Graff, the host of Business Edge Radio. Would you do me a couple of very big favors? First, I invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. This will help other forward thinkers just like you discover the show. Second, I ask that you share the show on your social media platforms. And third, I would love it if you connected with us on social at Unleashed Tribe on Facebook and Instagram, or log on to PowerMarketing101.com to find more great resources. If you could do this for me, you would be a superhero in my book, and I would be eternally grateful. For all the listeners of Business Edge Radio, I have a special gift for you. I want to give you a free copy of my book, High Voltage Branding. Go from ordinary to extraordinary as my way of saying thank you for being a loyal listener. The book covers the most important elements of how to develop a great brand, build a loyal fan base for your products and services, and ways to identify if your brand is broke. Whether you're an old timer or have a new business venture, having an impeccable brand is vital to your success. And this book will give you lots to think about. Simply go to powermarketing101.com slash free book. That's powermarketing101.com slash free book to download your free copy of the book High Voltage Branding. Go from ordinary to extraordinary as my special way of saying thanks for being a fan of the show. Do you remember the commercials for the beer Dos Equis and the world's most interesting man? The commercials would show him gallivanting around the world on yachts and in fancy restaurants, competing in sports, riding horses. And at the end of each commercial, it would show him sitting at a table with a few friends enjoying a beer. Well, I think that Michael Warshaw is the new world's most interesting man. And I think you'll agree after hearing his interview. He was born in Russia, moved to Australia when he was nine and has spent quite a bit of time in the United States. So first thing you're going to notice is he has a fascinating Russian, Australian, American accent. And he's been a professional photographer for over 45 years, and even though he has won countless international awards, he considers himself a much better marketer than a photographer. His entrepreneurial journey has been filled with many trials and tribulations, big wins, major losses, 
lots of single malt scotch and fancy cars. And he's known as a status quo disruptor, an innovator, and has blazed the trail for many other professional photographers and entrepreneurs. Decades, and I do mean decades, before it was a thing to make a video for YouTube showing your fancy car sitting in your garage, Michael was actually living that lifestyle, and not because he wanted to show off, but because he wanted to have a quality of life that afforded him the ability to enjoy the finer things that our world has to offer. With all that, please enjoy my interview with the world's most interesting man, Michael Warshaw. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Mitch. How are you? I'm doing very, very well. You're joining us from Melbourne, Australia. So you're 9 a.m. your time, 4 o'clock my time Pacific. So we got a couple hours between us right now. Well, and, and as I described in your introduction, you are quite the accomplished businessman slash photographer. In fact, you're probably one of the most renowned photographers in the entire world. That's, that's to say a lot because there's a lot of good photographers out there. And you live Melbourne, Australia. And you were you can tell by your accent, the listeners can tell that you're not from Australia. You are from Russia. I was born in Russia, in Moscow. And I am holding something in my hand. We're, instead of starting at the beginning, I kind of want to jump to actually 2017. And I have a thing in my hand here. It is from the Melbourne Lamborghini dealership in Melbourne, Australia. Mm -hmm. It's got the beautiful picture of a Lamborghini. I don't know the model number. Excuse me for that. <laughs> I'm not a Lambo uh, uh, connoisseur, but the license plate says MW1, assuming that means mm -hmm. Michael Warshaw won. And you are in the background kind of walking away. So it's kind of a photojournalistic type of image. That's at the top of this handout. And then it says, as a special thank you for being a valued client, Lamborghini Melbourne has organized a deluxe photographic session together with a signed desk size matted portrait valued at $880. And of course, it's compliments of you. I assume you donated this to the dealership. You get the people in there, you're going to give them an 8x10 print, and they're going to buy something else from you. I assume that. But the question I'm getting to here is, do you look at yourself as a better marketer than you do a photographer? That, that's a very good question. I've been asked that question many a time. And um, I think I'm a very competent photographer. Uh, in, you know, when I look at photography, I'm as good as anyone out there. But I'm a fairly unique business person. So I've always looked at photography as something that I enjoy doing because originally I studied chemistry. So I'm an industrial chemist. I got into photography because I didn't want to be a chemist after I finished <laughs> chemistry. Yeah, yeah, I studied chemistry and then um, I, when I finished chemistry, I got stuck into a, a, a laboratory doing research and I remember there were three people there and I said, where is everybody? And they said, well, this is it. And I think my life flashed in front of me and I thought, holy, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in this room with these three people. <laughs> Mixing and said, chemicals and beakers. That's it. And uh, I told my parents uh, that I was going to be a photographer. Well, they freaked out, totally freaked out. I remember my mother said, so, but how are you going to eat? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to be a photographer. So I went back to uh, college and I studied photography. And I found it very easy because of my chemistry background. But, but I also learned that photography in the, what I call, consumer space, because originally when I started my first job was photographing cars, because my, my uh, love has always been cars and people. So my first, when, when I was studying, I remember my first professional job was working for an ad agency photographing cars because I thought, holy, I really love cars. Uh, but then I realized that cars didn't speak back to me and I needed to photograph people. So um, then I realized photography um, was not a profession where, not in Australia anyway, where people just came to be photographed and they had to be incentivized. And I learned that very early in my career from American photographers uh, who um, opened up my eyes. I had no idea about business. I, I, I knew I could take a good photo because people came to me. I had a fairly good business when I was 24 years old. I already had my first Porsche, so I thought I was very good and I had a Hasselblad camera, so I thought I was, I was <laughs> wonderful. And then um, in the mid seventies, um, I went to the States and met some photographers who totally, totally changed my outlook on photography. Uh, not only the photography, but in the, the value of photography. And um, one in particular was a photographer in, in um, California uh, by the name of Philip Cheris, who taught me uh, the value of photography. I had no idea what photography is worth. 
but his journey was amazing. It was in Pasadena, just amazing. I learned all about packaging, presentation, and perceived value. Perceived value is what the customer perceives it's worth, not what uh, the piece of paper is worth. So, But that's going back a long time. Yes, yeah, so the Lamborghini was one of the things that I did. Um, prior to that, I started, uh, they were my third-party promotions. I was buying my car, my first Porsche, and when I bought the car, this is in the 70s, they gave me a, a, a basket with a book and some chocolates and a bottle of wine. And two years later, I changed my cars because I generally change my cars every couple of years. And they gave me a similar basket. And I looked at it and um, I thought, I've already got a basket. And I said to the, to the gentleman, I said, so how much do you spend on this gift? And he said, oh, $150. So I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, you give me the $150 and I'll give you a certificate for a photography a session with a portrait valued at $1,000. So um, he said, oh, that sounds good. So in those days, they were selling quite a few cars. I think that nearly 40, 50 Porsches a month, which is big for Australia. And every time they gave out a certificate, uh, I got $5,000. So I said, okay, that it's a good model. Got something. So built, You're onto something here. Uh, yeah. So I... Um, most of my, um, I mean, marketing is very, I spend most of my time reading books on sales and marketing and, and business. And of course, as we got into digital on, on lots of technology, I, I enjoy knowledge. So if, if there's something that I like, I will learn all about it. The same with whiskey and uh, my, some of my hobbies and cars. Uh, I, I need to learn all about the, the way things work. So yes, the Lamborghini was uh, one of the dealerships. I did that with uh, Lamborghini and with Ferrari and with Aston Martin and all the high end, because I figured anyone who can buy a car that's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars deserves a beautiful portrait by me. So they deserve the best, right? That's true. And I would consider you definitely an innovator and an out of the box thinker. Uh, there's a lot of great photographers out there. A lot of them that are better than you, hands down. Correct. But I, I will, I will bet you a dime a dollar that there's not a whole lot of people that are out marketing you, whether it's be in Australia or the United States or anywhere else in the world. When you were growing up, obviously in Russia, things were very constricted there. You weren't allowed to be the entrepreneur that you can be today. Well, in Russia, I was just a young kid. We came to Australia when I was uh, you know, nine years old. But I do remember in Russia standing in the queue uh, waiting for milk. It was winter, minus 20 degrees. And my mother said, you stay in the queue. And when you get to the shop, uh, if there's milk, you buy it. I said, okay. So I froze myself and then we came to Australia and I said, but mom, look, there's a shop. It's called the milk bar. You can buy all the milk you want anytime you want. We ca- when we came here, we were typical immigrants. Uh, we came with one suitcase. Um, my parents worked three jobs each. They put me through school, educated. I never went with that. We lived in a one room apartment, even at school. I was entrepreneurial. I remember I would have been 10 years old, maybe 11. And I wanted to get some money and my parents said, well, you can deliver newspapers like all the other kids do. You know, you had to get up at five in the morning, get on your bicycle and then you drive and you deliver newspapers. In those days, we had pounds and shillings before dollars came into Australia. I would earn two pound um, delivering newspapers and I said, that's not really what I want to do. So I walked down the street and I saw all these houses with cars. I said, hmm, this is sort of cars I'd like to sit in. So I knocked on their doors and said, look, I wash cars. Um, I'll wash your car for half a pound, 10 shillings. And they said, okay. So I used to wash cars on a Sunday. And by the end of the day, I'd make five pound, which was two and a half times what I would do if I was working, delivering newspapers. So I started my first business when I was about, must have been about <laughs> 10 and a half, 11 years old. And then, um, so I was entrepreneurial, obviously. I, I, I didn't uh, work, was not a fear. So uh, I then liked music, being, you know, typical immigrants. My parents made me play the piano accordion and I didn't like it, but I played it. And I always wanted to be a drummer. My parents uh, bought me a drum kit when I was 14 and a half, thereabouts. I really wanted to play professionally. So I went and learned from one of the best drummers in, in Australia. He happened to be in Melbourne and then uh, learned how to play music properly. I remember I said to my dad, there's an audition going on around uh, not far from where we lived. They were looking for a drummer uh, to play in a band on the weekends. It, it was a uh, like a hotel retreat. My dad said, well, okay. So he had to put the drums in the back of the car. We drove up to the uh, place and there were like you know, 20 people auditioning. And I said, no, no, I'm out of here because I was the youngest kid. I was 
I would have been 15 maybe, something like that. And dad said, no, no, if you, I've driven you, you're going to audition. And this happened to be a Latin American band. So I remember the guy, the guy who ran the band said, so can you play a bossa nova? I said, yep. Can you play a samba? I said, yep. He said, can you play cha-cha? I said, yep. He said, you've got the job. So there you go. So I um, joined the band, played on the weekends, and then somebody heard me. It, 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 this was a wedding that, that we were doing. And they said, look, I've got someone who runs a nightclub in the city. In, in town, you should go and audition. It's a four-piece uh, nightclub band. And I said, okay. So anyway, long story short, I went and auditioned. I got the job. And so how old were you? A, I would have been 16. So, yeah, probably 16, maybe 17. So I got the job playing in a nightclub and I thought, wow. So I, I would get dressed up in a dinner suit. I would um, play and I would um, be fed a la carte and I would meet all the people with the beautiful daughters. I thought, what a job. Amazing. <laughs> and at that stage, my father was working in a factory. He was earning, it was pounds. So it would have been 1960, 90, I would have been 16. So um, he was earning, I think, 47 pounds a week. And I was playing in a band after school, earning 55 pounds a week. So I thought, wow. So this is where it, we move into photography. So there was a guy who used to come in and he would walk around the tables. He would photograph all the people, go into this little room, and he would come out probably 20 minutes later, and he had black and white prints, and he would go and sell them for 10 shillings each. And I sat down there one day, and I counted, and I said, he's making more money than me. I said, I wonder what he does in that room. So I got to know him and went into the room, and, of course, he was doing black and white. Uh, he developed the film, still wet, and then he had a stabilizing machine. He'd run the paper through it and I uh, put him in a folder and 10 shillings. So I watched him for about three or four weeks and I said, sure, I can do this. So I remember I approached the owner of the nightclub and I said, I forgot to tell you that I'm also a photographer. So uh, I can play in the band and then during my breaks, I'll go around, take all the photos and I'll give you 10%. He said, hmm, that sounds, that's better than what I'm getting now. So I become a photographer. <laughs> so I used to play in the band and uh, during the breaks, walk around. So my income doubled. Still in high school, high school and you're, you're school, photographing school. at a nightclub on weekends, playing in the band, and you were living life and living it good. <laughs> couldn't complain. Well, I mean, you know, I, I did what I wanted to, and I enjoyed myself. Well, and I think that's the key, isn't it? That no matter what we do in life, whether it be to be a, a president of a business or a teacher or a, a bricklayer, you have to love what you're doing. And if you don't, you need to find something else to do. And you've been doing that's this for 45 plus years. And you yep. still are as passionate today as you were back in those days when you were 16 years old and didn't know what you were doing very much, but you still Correct. did it. You made some money. You said, hey, there's potential here. And there's tons of gurus now online that sh that are flashy, and I'll use that term. They'll show mm -hmm. their, their Lamborghini and their Porsche in the background, and look at I'm living the high life, living on the beach. Michael, I can attest personally that you've been living this life decades before it was a thing. Uh, it was, it's been part of your posana. Uh, you're a man that likes single malt scotch, and I want to ask you in a couple of minutes where you got that affinity <laughs> for that. But you like the finer things in life, and it's not because you want to flaunt or you want to show off or you want to say, hey, look at me. It's because of that quality of life that you have built your life around. And tell me how that kind of came about. What age were you when that became something that you said, you know what? I want to be the high end. I want to live on the top floor. I want to be that... The pretty woman, the Richard Gear line. Why do you live on the top floor? Well, because it's the best. <laughs> plain, I, I plain and simple. I, I don't think I actually thought of it like that. I always thought of things. I wanted to do what I enjoyed doing. So that was my driver. So when I get up in the morning, I had to be excited about what I do. So what I learned is when I did the things that I enjoyed doing, whatever they were, and I could bring value to someone because of what I did, be it playing in a band or wash a car. The value was I washed their car. I had a great time because I was sitting in, in Mustangs and, 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 you know, and I'm 10 years old and, and people paid me. So I said, okay, so I have to bring value to someone. It's not because of anything else. Photography was the same. I, I brought value. I happened to be good at it. Because all my life, I was a science student. I, I never, ever studied humanities or photography. Um, so, so when I did photography, when I went back to college, I remember the actual photography part was easy because that was science. And I remember they said to me, you have to do a humanities subject. I said, a what? They said, humanities. I said, what? 
that sort of thing. He said, well, here you have a choice. You can, you can do languages or you can do psychology. I said, well, I can speak a number of languages. I said, I'll do psychology. That was the best thing I ever did. I studied psychology. And uh, when I went through and I learned about Maslow and, and, and human uh, behavior and why people do things that they do, I said, that's interesting. That led me um, to do some courses. Uh, I would have been in my 20s then on, on body language. Then I learned about what people say and what people mean are two different things. But I did it because I enjoyed it. It wasn't because I wanted, you know, I had no, um, no reason except for wanting to learn how to do that. And that's been my, my whole life has been some, based on, I don't understand when someone says to me it can't be done or it's too hard or no one else has asked the question. I've had this happen to me my whole career. Um, we were in, in, in photography. When I got into photography, we were one of the first labs in the 70s to put in roll to roll. When did you get your first affinity for good scotch? Well, there you go. So that's a very good question. I know. So when I, when I started my lab, um, I started using Kodak materials and uh, the business grew reasonably well. So this would have been uh, mid 70s, maybe 76, something like that. Kodak gave me, um, we had a TSR technical sales rep, and he was a Scotsman, six foot four, six foot three. We became really good friends. He recently passed away. His name was Gordon Graham. And Gordon came to me at Christmas and said, Michael, I have a Christmas present for you. I said, oh, thank you. And he gives me a bottle. He said, oh, scotch. He said, no, no, no. He said, sit down. This is single malt. Okay. So when you sit down and you have a six foot four Scotsman standing over you, and he said, um, and this is a special one. It's Lafroy. I said, okay. He said, it's from Isla. None of this made sense to me. He said, uh, it's very special. He said, so um, it will either taste like medicine or you will love it. So I opened the bottle there and then and took a, a dram of it and uh, it tasted like medicine because it was very peaty. And I went, holy, that's horrible. But as it went down, it all changed. And I said, mm, this is interesting. So that's how I got introduced. Of course, then I said, well, I need to learn more about it because I had no idea. I thought scotch was uh, Johnny Walker Red with Coke. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we used to drink or bourbon and Coke. Uh, after that, I never mixed my drinks ever, ever, ever again. I then uh, investigated and I picked up some malts, which are, a malt is very different to a scotch. A scotch is a blended whiskey and it's blended from multiple malts and, and rye and all sorts of stuff. A single malt generally is... Uh, made in one area. It's like good wine, like in Oregon or in Melbourne. It's a particular vineyard, a particular grape variety. Uh, it's maturated in a particular barrel and they have different barrels. Uh, so the single malt gets its flavor from the actual barrel because all malt is just pure white and it's got no flavor. But when you put it in a wooden barrel, um, it's especially American oak because most of the barrels come out of the States because America, when you make bourbon, you can only put it in once. Okay, so the barrels, they can only use it once. And after that, they were dissolved to Scotland. So they would uh, mature their whiskies in, or the malt in, in a, generally in American oak, but then they also will get uh, Spanish um, sweet um, Madeira and port and stuff. So you get all your flavors come from the actual maturation. Um, and scotch or, or malt is actually, believe it or not, very healthy for you in small quantities. It is potent full of allergic acid, which is a very potent antioxidant. So I remember I downloaded the white paper on it and I showed it to my wife and I said, look, it benefits you, said, don't be silly. <laughs> yeah, nice try, uh, nice try. In full no, transparency, 10 or 15 years ago, I did a speaking tour throughout Australia, and I don't remember what town it was in, but you introduced me to, I want to say, Single Malt Society of the World or something. We went yeah, to this yeah, tasting. Yeah. And in front of me, they brought this beautiful piece of wood with five holes in it and five shot glasses and yep. a catalog. And we had to go through and sip each one and try to identify which island it came from. And, you know, you use words like pencil shavings. It tastes like pencil shavings. And, That's and right. how peating is. And that was a new experience for me. And here we are to this day. I enjoy a nice single malt. So I have to blame it's you for that. But it's one of those finer things. You don't have to spend a lot of money to get a single malt. You really don't. It's the same with bourbon. So, yeah, that's uh, I true. mean, it's a really good bourbon. It's not your basic stuff, but uh, I mean, I, when I drove through Kentucky and Tennessee, I learned all about bourbon and I have a, a pretty good collection of American bourbons. Uh, some you can't even get here. 
Uh, so, but my daughter, when she travels, in fact, she was in the States recently, um, just before the lockdown, she, um, I got her to find me some, um, rare Angel Zandy, which we can't get. And so you can't, you can't actually ship alcohol from America because they won't ship. You can only buy it through distributors who are licensed and some of the small, uh, specialized distilleries, they don't uh, sell to these people. So you, you can only buy it if you go to the States and you find a shop and you, you, you buy it. But it's the same it, it, if you acquire a taste um, and the same with single malts. I mean, it, it, they're very enjoyable. And as I said to you, you know, in Melbourne at the moment, it's a very cold winter, uh, cold nights. I put on an open fire. You sit and uh, you listen to good music and you sip on a good malt and uh, enjoy life while you can because you don't know what tomorrow has for you. So when you get up in the morning, you have to be excited about having the ability to get up, be healthy. That's one of the most important things I've learned. And I, uh, I try and look after myself and I, I eat reasonably well. I do eat well. I walk, I do 10,000 steps a day. And uh, before the lockdown, I'd go to gym and train twice a week. Well, Michael Warshaw, so, before we before we wrap this up, let's segue away from photography. And I just okay. have a couple of, we'll just call it the rapid fire round questions for you. Give right. me a hobby that not many people know about. And don't say drinking single malt scotch. Give me something that people don't know about you. Well, the other hobby, well, some people know is uh, going on a track and driving fast cars on a racetrack. Really? What's the fastest you've ever been? The fastest in my car, uh, I've done... 300 kilometers uh, in one of my Lamborghinis uh, on, on one of the rice tracks. That's, push, that's pushing on, 200. Yeah, right? over 200 miles. Yeah. Michael Warshaw, after 45 years, I sense more passion and energy in your voice now than I did 15 years ago when I met you. And your energy built through the interview as well. You can just feel that passion just <laughs> oozing out of your pores. And I appreciate <laughs> you coming on Business Edge Radio. Go pop a cork of a single malt. Spend some time with that beautiful wife of yours, and thanks for joining the show. Thanks, Mitch. Talk to you soon. Man, what a fascinating story Michael Warshaw has to tell. As I was listening to this interview a second time, it struck me how absolutely in love he is with his industry, and he's been a student his entire career, always wanting to learn more about how he can stay competitive and stay one step ahead of his competition. My biggest takeaway it was that we all need to stay laser beam focused on what our goals are and then methodically figure out how we can attain those goals. Great wisdom from one of the industry's great ambassadors. Time for Cooking Corner with Mitch. Yum. Now it's time for Cooking Corner with Mitch, where I share with you a tantalizing recipe that you can try at home this week. Today, we are going to put our baking aprons on. That's right, I said baking. And making a batch of Juliet's World Famous Gourmet Chocolate Chip Cookies. But today, let's call them Mama's World Famous Gourmet Chocolate Chip Cookies. (laughs) First step, as always, Get yourself a glass of your favorite beverage, put some nice music on in the background, and join me in the kitchen. Now, in full transparency, I like cooking more than baking because I've never liked having to stick to a recipe exactly like you have to do in baking. I've always liked the creative freedom that comes with cooking, or as they call it in the restaurant industry, chefing it. A little of this, a little of that. But in baking, If you go off prompter, you run the risk of having things go terribly wrong. My wife Tammy can attest to times when I have went completely off the trail and ended up with a mess. Mind you, a tasty mess, but a mess nonetheless. Hey, that rhymes. The good thing about sticking to a recipe is that if you like how it turns out today, you will like how it turns out tomorrow because you're using the exact same ingredients in the exact same proportions. All right. For starters, get your oven preheated to 375. Open a standard bag of chocolate chips. Toss a handful in your mouth, then set the bag aside for later. In a bowl, I want you to combine one and a quarter cups of brown sugar, one quarter cup of white sugar, and I think this is what makes this recipe so special and takes it to the next level 
is it has higher brown sugar than granulated sugar. They're normally one to one ratio. So this is the secret here. <laughs> Combine that with one cup of soft margarine, one egg, two and a quarter cups of flour, or feel free to substitute an all-purpose gluten-free flour if that's your thing. And it must be the all-purpose gluten-free or you will need to adjust some of the other ingredients and we don't want to mess with a good thing. One teaspoon baking soda, one half teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of vanilla, and go ahead and get everything happy together, mixing it with your hands. And once everything is mixed, go ahead and add the rest of that bag of chocolate chips. Then scoop them into one inch balls, place them on a nonstick cookie sheet, pop them into your oven for right at nine minutes, not eight, not seven and a half, nine minutes, or you're gonna mess up this recipe. See why I don't like baking so much? And a little side note, feel free to add a little more vanilla if you want. The cookie gods don't come down and yell at you, I promise. The best cookie is enjoyed right when they come out of the oven, so make sure you have your kids ready to go as soon as they are done. Give them a try, let me know how things turn out. Well, that will do it for this edition of Business Edge Radio. And my parting shot today is this. You can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. Maya Angelou. Unless you're baking. Until next time, this is Mitch Graff reminding you to live with passion. I'll catch you later. Hi there. This is Mitch Graff, the host of Business Edge Radio. Would you do me a couple of very big favors? First, I invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. This will help other forward thinkers just like you discover the show. Second, I ask that you share the show on your social media platforms. And third, I would love it if you connected with us on social at Unleashed Tribe on Facebook and Instagram, or log on to powermarketing101.com to find more great resources. If you could do this for me, you would be a superhero in my book, and I would be eternally grateful. For all the listeners of Business Edge Radio, I have a special gift for you. I want to give you a free copy of my book, High Voltage Branding. Go from ordinary to extraordinary as my way of saying thank you for being a loyal listener. The book covers the most important elements of how to develop a great brand, build a loyal fan base for your products and services, and ways to identify if your brand is broke. Whether you're an old timer or have a new business venture, having an impeccable brand is vital to your success. And this book will give you lots to think about. Simply go to powermarketing101.com slash free book. That's powermarketing101.com slash free book to download your free copy of the book High Voltage Branding. Go from ordinary to extraordinary as my special way of saying thanks for being a fan of the show. In today's business world, it is vitally important that you understand what I call the seven pillars of business success, which are lifestyle design, time management, branding, sales, marketing, pricing, and social media. Regardless of what industry you're in and whether you have a brick and mortar or you're only online, having a solid foundation in these skill sets will set you up for success down the road. And to personally help you with your journey, I've come out with the Business Edge podcast, which you're listening to right this second. And I've also written a book that I can highly recommend called Business Basics Bootcamp, the ultimate crash course now available on Amazon.com and will give you the 30,000 foot view of all these topics and many, many more. You know, reading is something that is slowly being replaced by videos and audiobooks or just scrolling through your newsfeed on social media. But I've always found reading to be kind of an escape from whatever is happening in the world. This book will help you slow down just a little bit so you can get your business house in order, so to speak, and get your creative juices a flowing. Log on to Amazon.com today and get your copy of Business Basics Bootcamp the ultimate crash course. You can search my name, Mitch Graff, or search the title of the book. In the dog-eat-dog world of business success, the weak will perish and the strong will survive. Which will you be?
Thanks for hanging out with Business Edge Radio. If you enjoyed today's show, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review. Then hop on over to www.mitchcraft.com to get even more meat and potatoes. We also invite you to follow the show at facebook.com slash unleashed tribe. The most valuable asset that any of us has is our time. And we thank you for choosing to spend some of your precious time with us. 